Okay, I do have a question then. Um, where is this being live streamed to? That's really cool. This is being live streamed to uh, the uh, Astronomical League's Facebook page. In addition to that, it's being uh, live streamed to Explore Scientific's YouTube page, our Facebook page, my own personal Facebook page, um, uh, and uh, one or two others. It's also on the homepage of cloudynights.com. Scott, can you live broadcast it to my Facebook page? Uh, I can if you give me your credentials. <laughs> I can. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. And let's put yeah. it online too. Yeah, we'll add you. Okay, we'll get together and do that. We still need to get the league's YouTube page up too. Yes. Yeah. And we share this this program on uh, popular Facebook, you know, astronomy groups, that kind of thing. Okay. Martin Eastburn just signed on. He says, "Howdy from East Texas." So you're watching the 17th Astronomical League live program. Yep. I'm starting to get ready for the 2023 annular eclipse too. And not to oh, mention yeah. the lunar eclipse tomorrow night that our Sunday right. night that I will be rained out of. We're going to have a party here at Explore Scientific. So I'm ordering pizzas and drinks and <laughs> And then we'll be uh, simulcasting the uh, event with astronomers who will log in from around the world. Um, so, what's your forecast like for for that? For Arkansas, for the eclipse, yeah. Arkansas yeah. is iffy. Okay, yeah. as it's always iffy. I mean, today we've already had bright sunshine in the morning. We had a thunder shower, and now it's bright sunshine again. <laughs> and uh, so, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's looking more and more like Sunday evening. It's going to be raining here. So uh, yeah. I definitely won't be heading west. It looks like to get out of the clouds. I'll have to see if there's anywhere I can drive to get out from under the clouds. Paul Burgart from uh, Central Kansas logged in. Barbara Harris out from hey. Florida is just logged hey, in. Hey, Barb. She says hello, Scott and Terry. So yeah. Glad you're home, Barbara. Definitely. I got everything running really good the other night. We're going to be talking about Alcon too. We've got Jim Fordyce here that will right. be giving us the latest update on Alcon here in just a few minutes, which I'm looking forward to. I haven't been to Albuquerque in a while. And there's Chuck. There's Chuck. How's that new computer working, Chuck? Is is he muted? Yes, he's muted. Or oh, we can't hear you. There. No. We're getting heavy static with you. Yeah, Chuck, I would unplug and replug back in. It sounds like the connector is a little wonky. Wonky. That's where I heard that word. That, yeah, that's right. It's an astronomical thought... term that's often used at the Jet Propulsion <laughs> Laboratory, Goddard Space Flight <laughs> Center, NASA, you know, uh -huh. GSA. I found myself saying wonky the other day and thought, where did I get that from? Good. Is it good? Yep, gotcha. Turns out this series, the first and largest asteroid discovered in the main asteroid belt, 
surprisingly has been geologically active within the past billion years. NASA's Dawn spacecraft arrived at dwarf planet Ceres in March 2015. We were expecting a, an inert uh, rocky body. We expected Ceres to be a cold rock. One intriguing feature Dawn discovered on the surface of Ceres is an enormous lone mountain the team named Ahuna Mons. We are uh, looking in detail about uh, the shape of the mountain. It was very tall and had steep slopes, and that reminded us of certain places in the solar system, including Earth and Mars, that had domes that were formed by volcanic activity. And we have found that uh, Ahuna Mons' uh, shape is very similar to that of a volcanic dome. Along with the shape of the dome, the facts are that there is no evidence of another formation mechanism such as an impact crater, and the surface features on the summit and sides of the mountain look incredibly similar to known volcanic domes. This all provides substantial evidence that Ahuna Mons is in fact of volcanic origin. Volcanoes on Earth are fueled by magma composed of molten rock. But Ceres is far too cold to melt silicate rock in its interior. We then concluded that the, the magma had to be composed of mostly very salty water and when exposed to the surface they would freeze and form this steep-sided dome. A volcano made of water or other rices instead of rock is called a cryovolcano. Scientists have detected evidence of cryovolcanic activity before. Plumes from Saturn's moon Enceladus and Neptune's moon Triton, and volcanic-looking mountain ranges on Saturn's moon Titan. The salty, muddy mountain Ohuna Mons is yet another new form of cryovolcanic activity discovered. There's no other place in the solar system that has a structure that matches that of, of Ahuna Mons, and it has to be formed by cryovolcanic activity. Moons around gas giants can heat up from the frictions of their interacting orbits. But the isolated dwarf planet Ceres is so small and cold that we wouldn't have thought it could have liquid water in its recent past. Evidence suggests, however, that Ahuna Mons is a relatively young feature. First of all, the surface is very bright, and as the surface uh, get dark with time, uh, its, its brightness tells us it's, it's a young feature. And second, we see very crisp morphologies, very sharp uh, features. And this also tells us it's, it's a young, as the features get muted and smooth uh, with time. And third, we have uh, been looking at the crater density, and we see very low density of craters. And this tells us that Ahuna Mons was formed in the last billion year of Ceres history. Ahuna Mons is the evidence that Ceres was active in the recent past and might be still active today. That tells us that there has to be something beneath the surface of Ceres, near Ahuna Mons, that heated the material to the melting point and made it push through the cracks on the surface. The source of this heat is still an intriguing mystery that planetary scientists are anxious to solve. Hello everyone, this is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance. And it's our honor uh, to present the 17th Astronomical League live program uh, with host Terry Mann. Um, Terry uh, has some special guests on tonight, and I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you very much, Scott. Yeah, we've got a lot of excellent guests tonight, a lot of update for the league. We've got David uh, Levy and Chuck Allen, not to mention, not to forget Jessica Noviello and Jim Fordyce from Alc for giving us an update on Alcon. He is the president of the Albuquerque Astronomical Society. So let's get started with David. How about that, David? Well, thank you very much. And uh, welcome to the uh, Astronomical League meeting. The Astronomical League goes back a long, long way. Uh, I think that um, Carlo Shapley was one of the founders of the Astronomical League, and um, he did an awful lot of wonderful things for astronomy. And uh, this is a very, very important meeting because in just two days from now, there will be a total eclipse of the moon. 
It starts Sunday night. Where you are in the Eastern time zone, it will be uh, starting at around 10 o'clock or so. And here where I am in the Arizona desert, the moon will rise with the penumbral phase already in progress. And the umbral phase will begin right after moonrise. I'm very anxious to see what the luminosity of this eclipse is. A few months ago, a very large, massive undersea volcano erupted in the Pacific Ocean, sending ash miles and miles into the upper stratosphere. And just last month, Anna Krakatoa, another very famous volcano, erupted, also sending ash into the stratosphere. And if that ash is still there, this could be a very dark eclipse. So what I'd like you to do is to estimate the luminosity using the Dangeon scale, where L equals four is a almost barely detectable shadow at mid totality. The moon would be a bluish red color all the way to darker and darker till you get to L equals zero, where the moon actually becomes pretty hard to see. Uh, the darkest lunar eclipse I've ever seen was November, December 30th, 1963. At mid totality, the moon was, for where I was, was invisible. I couldn't find it. I also have a, a poem about a lunar eclipse to offer you this evening. It was written by Thomas Hardy. After he saw an eclipse in London in 1902, he wrote this poem in 1903. It was well over a century old. It tells you a lot about lunar eclipse and the peace of cosmic time. But it also tells you a little bit about what the state of our world was back then, and quite a bit more about what the state of our world is right now. So here goes. Thy shadow earth from pole to central sea now steals along the moon's meek shine an even monochrome and curving line of imperturbable serenity. How shall I link such sun-cast symmetry with the torn, troubled form I know as thine? That profile placid as a brow divine with continents of moil and misery. And can of men's mortality but throw so small a shade and heaven's high human scheme be hemmed within the coast yon arc implies? Is such the stellar gauge of earthly show, nation at war with nation, Brains that team heroes and women fairer than the skies. Thank you very much. And back to you, Terry. Thank you, David. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Uh, we really appreciate it. And what I'd like to do now is normally Carol Orge is here. Um, and he had to be elsewhere tonight. But he asked me to make one announcement. And that is any master observer who wishes to get her or his plaque at Alcon 2022 must register for the convention and check the question on the registration form regarding attendance so we can get your plaque ready. This must be submitted by May 25th, 2022, so we have time to get the plaque made. And the registration link is http alcon 22astroleagueorg So if you're a master observer, Please check that out so they can have the plaque ready in time. So next up, speaking of Alcon, I'd like to introduce John, uh, Jim Fordyce, and he is here to give us an update on Alcon. So Jim, take it away. Well, uh, good evening, and uh, um, um, nice to see you all from the land of enchantment here. Let me get my slides up, and I'll get started. You should see an Alcon 2022 slide now. Is that right? Yes. Okay, good. So um, as you can see, uh, we've got Coco Pelli now uh, using a, a telescope and seeing some some uh, constellations that you all should recognize and uh, in our uh, New Mexico background. And uh, we're looking forward to having you all come out and join us here in, in late July. Now things actually uh, kick off on the 27th of July I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, first, when and where. Uh, so again, uh, 28 to 20, uh, uh, 28 to 30 July, 
2022 is the main part of the conference. Uh, we will be doing it at the Embassy Suites Hotel. It's a very nice uh, convention facility here in Albuquerque. Uh, room rates uh, are running $129. And uh, believe me, that is a heck of a rate in comparison to what it would cost if you weren't coming in on the conference rate. So you want to make sure you get your, your lodging uh, reservations uh, early. Uh, they also are pretty nice in that uh, single or double room costs the same amount and triples and quads only add $10 each. Uh, so that's a pretty good deal for large groups, families. Uh, they have complimentary Wi-Fi there, a complimentary cook to order breakfast, which is supposed to be pretty excellent. And uh, they also have a complimentary evening reception uh, for everybody at the hotel. But we're going to be kind of busy in the evening, so I'm not sure if you'll be able to take advantage of that, but, uh, but it will be there. Um, registration costs for the conference itself. Uh, the big thing I want to point out is that the prices are going up uh, on the 25th of May. Uh, so right now you can register as a single for $90, a couple for $135, and if you're a student for $45, and all those go up modestly on the 25th of May. Many that's a mechanism to get you all to get signed up early so that we can, we can get things ordered uh, in order to support the number of people who are coming. Uh, what that registration includes is access to the ballroom for all speakers, um, a very nice uh, souvenir uh, conference bag. Um, a program, a lapel pin, which will have that, uh, that logo on it uh, that I showed you on the first slide. And it also uh, provides you access to the 27 July welcome reception. So that's a reception we'll hold, I think it's at 5 p.m. on the 27th uh, to kind of kick off everything. Uh, there will be uh, some uh, uh, hors d'oeuvres available at that, light hors d'oeuvres and uh, a cash bar. Uh, just briefly, the schedule, um, starting off again on Wednesday, we will be doing an Alcon, or excuse me, the Astronomical League Council uh, meeting. Uh, that will take place all day. For those of you who are on the council, uh, you'll be uh, 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 sequestered away in a room and, and doing all those nice uh, AL things. Uh, we will have that welcome reception I just mentioned, and then we will have a van that will take you down to the to the TASS Observatory. It's called the General Nathan Twining Observatory. That's south of the city by about 50 miles. It's a nice dark place. And uh, you get a chance uh, to see some stars at night. Then on Thursday is our first main conference day. Uh, everything will get kicked off by Glenn Chapel from Astronomy Magazine talking about the uh, observing basics. So he's going to be a great speaker, I think. But we'll start off, uh, you can register that day, although you can also register on the 27th. Um, we will have a welcome for you. There will be a spectroscopy workshop that day. There'll be five speaker sessions. And then we will go back to GNTO again uh, that night as well. Um, and... Um, uh, be a good way to, to finish up the day, I think. Um, on Friday, as second conference day, uh, uh, we will have uh, the Astronomical League annual meeting. Uh, that will be followed by an astrophotography workshop at the same time, along with uh, three speaker sessions and a panel discussion led by, by Carol Orr's, the Astronomical League president. Um, uh, that evening, uh, Apollo 17 astronaut Harrison Schmidt uh, will be uh, available for a VIP session that you can uh, uh, join uh, so that you can meet him in person. Um, or you can uh, just come to the dinner where he will present uh, something about uh, his experiences on the moon. Uh, back uh, when uh, uh, he was celebrating the 40th anniversary of his flight to the moon. Um, I was involved with the Navy League, and we had him give a presentation, and it was just really fascinating. He's a remarkable guy to uh, to get to uh, visit with. Uh, he's a lot of fun, and uh, it's really a, a great opportunity for us to have him here in Albuquerque. And uh, he just really does a lot in support of astronomy things in this area. So I, I really encourage you to, to join in on that. And then following all of that, I will have an observance session down at the Via Oro. It's a national wildlife refuge in the, on the south side of Albuquerque. It is the first 
urban night sky place designated by the um, International Dark Sky Association. And so they're very proud of that. It's a very nice facility. They've just opened a brand new visitor center. And uh, it'll be, a, again, a nice way to finish up the day doing a little observing in close to the city. Um, on Saturday, our third conference day, uh, we will have the Observing Award Coordinator Meeting. We will also have Youth Award presentations, a photometry workshop, four speaker sessions, and then the awards banquet that evening, where the main speaker will be Seth Shostak. He's a senior astronomer at the SETI Institute, and he's going to talk about why we haven't found the aliens. So that should be interesting. So, uh, um, looking forward to that, and that's going to be a nice way to sort of wrap up the evening. Uh, as uh, Terry mentioned earlier, you have to do certain things to be able to get your Master Observer plaque if you haven't done it yet. The answer to that is, is you go to the Alcon website, you register for the conference. We will ask you questions like, are you a Master Observer? Have you received your plaque yet? And if the answer to uh, the first question is yes, and the second question is no, um, and if you register for the awards banquet, I will add you to the list of those who receive their plaques at the, at the banquet. So far, I have 10 names on that list. Uh, seven of them happen to be from TAS, so you can could, you could tell that we've been pushing real hard in this area. But nonetheless, we've got a few uh, from outside of New Mexico, and I hope to see more. Uh, that's always a lot of fun, seeing people receive their plaques. Um, some special tourist trips and, uh, and other events that we'll have going on. You can visit the UNM, it's the University of New Mexico Institute of Meteoritics on Wednesday, <clears throat> excuse me, on Wednesday. That $12 is for the van trip to take you over there. Uh, that We'll have the two GNTO star parties that I've mentioned. Um, the van trip is $12. It takes you down to a four acre dark sky site. It's about 45 miles south of Albuquerque. We've got both the main dome, which is what you see in the picture there that says General Nathan Twining Observatory on it. And then we have a smaller dome for imaging. We also have a cafe and meeting slant bunking uh, buildings and 22 observing pads. We'll have a lot of telescopes out there. So you don't need to bring a telescope, just uh, come and, and we'll, uh, we'll show you the sky. If you do, however, um, uh, are coming to, um, of the Alcon and you're bringing a telescope and you want to drive down to the site, there's some instructions on the website on how to contact me and we'll give you uh, directions on how to drive yourself down uh, to the site on your own. Um, you can also go to the Rainbow Park. Uh, that is the, the observatory uh, for the Rio Rancho Astronomical Society. They're going to have a tour of their facility and lunch on Thursday. The $19 pays for the van trip as well as the lunch. Uh, here's some other speakers that will be uh, featuring during the, uh, the Alcon. Uh, you'll notice, uh, you'll recognize a lot of the names on this list. Uh, one of the ones on here that I'm really excited about is Anne Finkbeiner. She's an author who wrote a book called A Grand and Bold Thing. It's about the, uh, uh, the Sloan Digital Survey that was, of course, conducted here in New Mexico. So it's a good tie uh, uh, to us here. And that's a great read. I, did, I read that about five years ago and was really excited to find that we could get her to come and talk to us. Um, and so uh, we're going to have, a, I think, just a, a really good slate of speakers here for you to enjoy. Uh, some other things going on, as I mentioned, uh, Harrison Schmidt will be with us. Uh, here's a picture of him as a young man when he was uh, still going to the moon. And then uh, a little bit more recent, still a good looking guy. He's uh, in his late 80s now, and but still going strong and talking fast. So <laughs> he's, he's very personable. He's just a lot of fun to be with. And uh, if you can afford $100 for the VIP session, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, what you get for that is not only get to meet him personally, but you'll get a signed copy of his book about the moon. And we'll also give you a drink and some, uh, some hors d'oeuvres uh, to get you ready for dinner. And then, of course, the dinner and the presentation uh, follow after that. <clears throat> Uh, Biodora was also going to be a lot of fun. We want to showcase our 
our urban night sky place here in uh, in Albuquerque. And uh, that's just a, a short drive really from the hotel. It'll take us about 15 minutes to get there. So I'm planning to do all that uh, that day, do the VIP session, do the dinner, and then get down to Valladaro and uh, finish up the evening uh, sometime around about 11 or so that night. Should be a great day. Uh, then, of course, we'll have the awards banquet on Saturday. That runs about $70 to attend that one. Uh, and then I think one of the best features that we have is, is the fact that we're relatively close to the very large array, which is just a really good place to visit if you are at all interested in astronomy. To get up close to those antennas and, and see them is just really a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to do that on Sunday so that it's outside the normal conference uh, time so that everybody can spend the day doing it because it is about a two and a half hour drive to get over there uh, on a nice bus so that you uh, can sleep on your way there and sleep on your way back. Uh, we're offering two pa packages. One is the tour, transportation and lunch uh, that will run $70. And uh, for $90, though, you can add in a dinner a tour of the Lyceum, which is a John Briggs's uh, uh, Museum of Ancient Telescopes, I think is the way to say it. I mean, he's got a lot of old telescopes there, but uh, if there's a guy who's looked through more telescopes than anybody else, I think that's John Briggs. If not, he's a close second. He has an amazing number of very interesting things to look at in his museum in Magdalena, New Mexico. And then following that, uh, we will do a uh, following dinner, we will do a night observing session out near Pie Town. If you're familiar at all with New Mexico, there is a town called Pie Town, and you really can get pie there, and it's all pretty good. But he has a place out there where he has a 40-inch Dobsonian. And uh, all I can tell you is, is when John Briggs looked through that Dobsonian, he said it was the best viewing he's ever seen. It's really amazing. Uh, so I'm looking forward to getting some clear skies at night and really get a chance to see something. You can see a couple of pictures of it here. Uh, on, on the bottom left is the rollout uh, uh, setup that he has for it. And then you can see how tall that thing is, even though it's probably about an F3 or something, I imagine it's still pretty tall because it's got so much uh, aperture on it. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, that will wrap up sometime about 1 a.m. You'll get back to Albuquerque. That'll be a long day, but you will be on the bus so you can sleep on it and you don't have to worry about whether you're going to fall asleep and drive off the road or something like that. So it's, that's going to be, I think, a real good way to end up the Alcon and um, uh, say you really got something accomplished that week. Um, let me give you a little status on registration. I want to first start off by saying we're expecting about 250 people for the Alcon. That's what it will take to, to break even. Uh, right now, uh, just updated with orders that came in in the last few minutes today, I've got 87 people that are registered for the conference. That's 39 singles and 24 couples. So really, there's a lot of couples coming. I was surprised at the number. I have 47 people signed up for the awards banquet, 34 for the Schmidt dinner, uh, eight for the Schmidt VIP reception. And then for the VLA tour right now, it's running even. There's 13 for just the tour and 13 for the tour and observing. Um, the interesting thing is, is when I checked with the hotel, uh, we're doing pretty good on uh, selling the rooms. About 60% of them are sold out. And when I compare the names on the lodging list, to the names of the people who have registered for the conference, only about half the people who have registered for rooms have registered for the conference so far. So I'm expecting that those folks will, will sign up. I think, yeah, Chuck Allen's one of those. <laughs> and uh, he's got two rooms, as a matter of fact. So uh, so I'm, I'm expecting those people to come in. We should get a good surge. And, and I want to remind you, get registered by the 25th so you pay the, the regular price. And I think with that, uh, subject to your questions, uh, that's my contact info there, and I am done. Well, thank you, Jim. I have a question. Yeah. Is the VLA still closed to the public right now? Um, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure. I, I think it might still be, but, but we're we're very confident, have been assured that we're going to be able to do these tours. Well, that's a good reason for more people to sign up for the tour. Especially if the public can't get in, this is the way to get in and take a private tour. 
Right, right. And I and, and some people have asked, well, can I go and then just participate in the tour? And I said, no, you, you need to ride the bus. You know, we can't manage the d- lunches and the dinners and right. all that you being yeah. on the bus. So it's a it's a package deal. That's the only way to go. Otherwise, you're just on your own. And you know, I, I, I can't be sure if you're going to be able to even get in. Right. Yeah. So if you want to see the VLA, this is a guaranteed way to do it. Absolutely. And I've been there twice and, and I've enjoyed it both times. There's a lot of things to look at and, and see there. And it's, it's just a, uh, you know, a great place to, to be if you're uh, at all interested in astronomy. It's just really yeah. something to see in person. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. Uh, Chuck, I hope you're warming up in the wings because we're going to get ready to go to you. And Jim, I can't wait to meet you in person at, in Albuquerque. Well, same here, Terry. Looking yeah. forward to it. I, I see you You have placed your order and, and you're on that list for registrants. And yep. I know we're going to get enough uh, to, to make it all work. Yeah, I was surprised when I went in because originally I had a different room picked out and they were all sold out uh, at that point. they are. I think they have King Rooms right now that's listed on the website and that's all they have at this point. So, well, so it, it, it depends on what time frame you put in. When we when we first started having that that link come up, uh, it was including the 26th of August. And, and that actually was a mistake. It should have started on the 27th because we have a limited number of rooms on the 26th. And those sold out at one point. And Ron Kramer had called me and said, hey, I can't get the right because you know it says it's not available and i said you know i checked and said no we'll, we'll get that fixed and, and then we we got the number of rooms for the 26th uh, bumped up a little bit we have 35 and i think uh, 26 of those have sold uh, the last i checked though we had about 50 rooms sold out of 80 that are on uh, our allocation so uh, so that is something that if you're wanting to get that 129 dollar rate you really need to get in soon on that Definitely. Definitely. Um, yeah, especially all of us on council meeting that need to be there the day early before t- Tuesday night. So we're there on time for council on Wednesday. Right. And, and I should say, if any if anybody has any trouble, you'll feel free to contact me. Uh, we, we can work with the hotel to to get you enough allocation to, to get the, the, the good rate. OK, well, thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. And we're going to have you come back again next month on June 17th to give us another update. See what's going on. Will do. Okay, thank you. All right, Chuck, how are you today? Doing well, thank you. Well, good. Uh, Chuck is here. He is going to give us a really interesting program. I read the synopsis and I thought, whoa, I, I like the sound of this. So, Chuck, I'm going to let you you get into it. So, take it away. Okay, thank you. First of all, Jim, uh, I'm bringing three people, uh, Scott Harrington and two of his siblings. We're still trying to figure out where his siblings are going to want to go during the convention. That's why we're a little late on the registrations, but they'll be coming in next week. Um, <clears throat> just a word about that. Uh, these folks in Albuquerque have been planning this thing for over three years, probably four, uh, because of two cancellations. So uh, it's going to be a heck of a convention. I hope you can join us. Okay. 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 First of all, is my audio okay? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, what we're going to talk about tonight is a very simple question. It's how far can we see as human beings? And this is really a question that falls into three areas. Uh, it falls into the, the area of physical horizons, those that are imposed by the curvature of a world on which we might be standing. Um, it's imposed by optical limitations, the sensitivity of the human eye with or without aid and also by the effects in large distances of the expansion of space and uh, the speed of light. And so we'll look at all three of these. The first are the physical horizons. <clears throat> Just so we understand what we're talking about with a physical horizon, when you look out at the ocean and you see that blue line in the distance, what you're really seeing is a point uh, that meets a perpendicular to the center of the earth at a right angle, as you see here. And this is what you see. And if you're standing such that your eyes are six feet above the water, uh, maybe you're standing on the beach a foot above sea level, uh, <clears throat> the horizon is about 3.1 miles away. And what that means is that if there were a person standing at sea level 
6.2 miles away, that person would be completely invisible to you. On the moon, because the moon is smaller, uh, the horizons are closer. The views that the Apollo astronauts had when they were standing on the moon was only 1.5 miles away. Obviously, on a planet larger than the Earth, the horizon uh, would be substantially further. Another factor is not just the size of the world you're standing on, but how high above the world you're standing. And a very simple formula that you can perhaps remember to determine this <clears throat> is the square root of 13 times your height in meters. So, for example, if your eyes are 10 meters above the uh, surface of the world, about 33 feet, um, you take the square root of 130 and you get about 11 kilometers. And that's the distance to the horizon from that point. So if you're about 100 feet up, your horizon is about 12 miles away. If you're 2,722 feet standing at the top of the Burj Khalifa, your horizon would be 64 miles away on a clear day. Summit of Mount Everest approaching 264 miles. Interestingly, though, the furthest line of sight uh, that holds the Guinness Book of World Records on the surface of the Earth is not from the summit of Mount Everest but rather from the Peak du Finistrelle in the Pyrenees. From there, one can look 275 miles at a backlit uh, Peak Gaspard in the Alps. Uh, you're looking across the Golfo de Leon in the Mediterranean. And the distance of this view is 275 miles. It was a picture taken by Mark Brett. And the Peak Gaspard is this little lump right here in the picture. Distance again, 275 miles away. That's the longest line of sight ever recorded. Now, I was sitting in my building one time looking out over the community in my home about 10 miles away, and I began wondering how much the earth dropped away as I looked out over that distance. And so I kind of imagined myself standing at the ground level on a steel plate, a giant steel plate that simply was perpendicular to the center of the earth, but which extended out at some distance. And I wondered how fast the earth would drop away from under that steel plate. And here you see the results, about eight inches after a mile and looking out 10 miles to my home, the horizon dropped 67 feet below what would be the horizontal if the earth were completely flat. The drop is about eight inches per mile squared uh, as a rule of thumb. So if you're standing on a steel plate in uh, Dover, Delaware, and wondering how much below a flat horizon California would be, it's about 789 miles below. You can see the curvature of the Earth or its effects. Just get in the water in the ocean, get your eyes down near the top of the water, and watch a boat sailing over the horizon. You can see its sails, but not the hull of the boat. Another place is Lake Pontchartrain, where you can see power lines that clearly curve over the curvature of the Earth as they disappear over the roughly 28 miles to the other side. Uh, if the Earth were flat, those power lines would continue in a straight line and converge at a horizon 288 feet higher at the horizon than you see. I said 28 miles, it's just under 24 miles distance. A place where you can experiment with seeing the curvature or its effects is the Bonneville Salt Flat in Utah. Now this of course is a dried salt bed, so it conforms perfectly to the curvature of the earth because it conformed to sea level when there was water there. And because of that eight inch drop over one mile, if you place a flashlight perfectly horizontal, which it doesn't really appear to be here, but nonetheless, if you do, and go a mile away and drop below about eight inches, the beam of the light should disappear because of that curvature. It's a nice experiment to try if you're over in Utah. Well, the next thing we need to talk about is optical horizons. And these are the limits imposed uh, by the human eye, uh, either with or without optical aid. And just to give you an idea, we're gonna be talking about photons here. A 100 watt bulb that you may have in your home puts out 300 quintillion photons each second. Okay, and of course that's easily seen from close up. The folks down at Texas A&M decided to run an experiment where they tried to see from what distance, despite haze, dust in the air, and ambient light in the atmosphere, they could see a candle. And they were able to detect a candle at a distance of 1.6 miles. 
the flux, that is the number of photons entering a fully dilated eye at that distance from a candle was estimated to be about 2,700 photons per second. That's about 270 photons for each integration period of the eye. Uh, you don't accumulate the light over a second, only for short increments that are recorded as vision in the brain. A magnitude plus 0.85 star is visible if you remove all extraneous light. So go out in the middle of the Pacific, perhaps down to Jim's observatory, uh, uh, 50 miles south of Albuquerque, and you have a shot at seeing eighth magnitude stars. The flux here, if you're able to see a star at plus 8.5, and that's really difficult, you need perfect conditions, would be about 27 photons for each integration period of the eye, or 270 per second. Now, I had an experience observing with a 12-inch SCT one time in Bortle Three Skies, and I was observing NGC 499 as part of the Herschel 2 program and noticed a little blob over here on the right. And the guidebook that I happened to have with me that night said to look for NGC 496 in the same field. So satisfied with that, I started to sketch the field and I noticed this little tiny smudgelet moving in between the two. So I, I had no way of looking it up and I sketched it in. And sure enough, there was an object called NGC 498 that was listed at magnitude 16.0. So I did a calculation trying to figure out how many photons I was seeing because this thing was ghostly. It was just only with field movement that I was able to detect it. And so I did some calculations that took into account the number of photons per cubic centimeter, square centimeter that we received from a magnitude plus 16 star. I took into account glass transmission in the SCT, the extinction of the atmosphere at 50 degrees, corneal transmission, and the integration rate of the eye, which is really a tenth of a second. I should have changed this. And it came out to nine photons per integration period that I may have been detecting when I saw that object. So how few photons can we detect? Well, Dr. Ala Pasha Vaziri at uh, Rockefeller University set up a very complex experiment to determine this. He placed subjects in a closed room where they would stare at a very faint red fixation light, and they would hear two audible signals. And between those two signals, a single photon, a complex device capable of issuing single photons, was projected into the eye. Uh, such that it would hit rods in the peripheral retina of the eye. The individual was then asked to state whether they, to press a button indicating that they had seen something with low confidence or high confidence or not at all. And amazingly, the people who indicated high confidence that they had seen a single photon was 60% of the time. The people who had low confidence were correct 52% of the time. This was considered to be statistically significant for seeing a single photon using the human eye under ideal circumstances. So what are the faintest things we can see in terms of stars with the unaided eye? Well, the faintest star, the furthest star that you can see rather, not the faintest, the furthest star that you can see is a 5.8 magnitude star V76762 in Cassiopeia. It lies at 16,308 light years. Um, there are fainter stars you can see that are closer, but this is the furthest one visible to the human eye. There have been stars further away that have been visible to humans. In 1885, a supernova erupted in the Andromeda galaxy, M31, and it was visible at fifth magnitude from Earth uh, at a distance of two and a half million light years. But if you had been extraordinarily lucky, uh, back on March 19th of 2008, you might have been able for just a few seconds to see a 5.5 magnitude gamma ray burst in the constellation Boötes. It was above magnitude 6.0 for about 30 seconds, and the distance to that gamma ray burst, 7.5 billion light years. Wow. I don't know of anyone who actually saw it live, but I would love to meet the person who did. Uh, this is Scott Harrington, who will be one of the speakers uh, uh, at uh, Alcon 22 uh, in Albuquerque. And this young man I met uh, as a result of some research he started doing at age 14 to determine the faintest things that were visible from his home in Arkansas on a rural farm uh, to the naked eye and to 7 by 35 binoculars. Now, he's ex since expanded this research to larger instruments. Uh, he's published it online. 
And he now writes for Sky and Telescope magazine. He had the, the cover uh, feature article about a year ago, and he will have another article in Sky and Telescope coming out uh, this year. He's a consummate observer. Naked Eye, uh, the furthest thing that he was able to determine from research and from his own observations in the realm of emission nebulae was the Swan Nebula, magnitude 7.5, 5,900 light years. The furthest open cluster, NGC 884, one of the two components of the double cluster in Perseus at nearly 10,000 light years. Globular clusters, furthest one, M2, visible naked eye at 37,500 light years in Aquarius. And the furthest galaxy that he has been able to detect, M81 uh, in Ursa Major at 11 million light years, but I since gave a talk to the Minnesota Astronomical Society and an individual there while traveling down south was able to detect uh, NGC 5128, often referred to as the radio source Centaurus A at magnitude plus 6.8. And its distance is somewhat uh, wide range, to, uh, but it's estimated to be approximately 13 million light years away. And if so, that may be the furthest galaxy visible naked eye. Hmm. Now with seven by 35 binoculars, and you'll hear from Scott about this in Albuquerque, one can actually see a galaxy nearly 70 million light years away, NGC 3607, visible in seven by 35s. In amateur telescopes, we can go a lot further. A popular target, of course, is 3C273 in Virgo, magnitude 12.9. It lies at 2.44 billion light years light travel time. That's roughly where it is now, a little bit further because of expansion since uh, the light left there. This is visible in small telescopes. Eight inches can pick it up. If it were located where Arcturus is, 36 light years away, we would have a second sun in the sky. But there's something further that is detectable with large daubs that amateurs own, and that is this little red object right here. Now, this is uh, a, an object, uh, it's a quasar uh, in Lynx uh, that lies at a light travel distance of 12 billion light years, and it is visible, again, at magnitude 15, certainly accessible in large Dobsonians. And uh, you want to give that a try because I don't know of any human being who has visually seen anything further than that. In fact, I would be almost certain no one ever has. They photograph further things, but never visually seen anything further than this. The light that we're seeing here heavily reddened because it's been traveling through expanding space for so long um, has come to us uh, over a period of time that it nearly equals the age of the universe at 13.8 billion years. If it were located where Arcturus is, we'd be in serious trouble. It would shine mm -hmm. from 36 light years at a brightness of 16 million times brighter than the sun. Professional telescopes, of course, can show us things much deeper in space. The furthest confirmed object that we've ever detected is this little galaxy GNZ11 in Ursa Major. It has a light travel distance of 13.4 billion light years. That means when the light left there, the universe was only 400 million years old. This was just shortly after stars started to form. Of course, you can see that it's full of brand spanking new hot blue-white stars. Well, they don't look too blue-white right here, do they? This is what it really looked like at the time the light left there. But by the time it got here, it was heavily reddened because it had been moving through expanding space for so long. Its current location today is 32 billion light years away, which means it is receding from us in whatever form it has today at more than twice the speed of light. However, last month, uh, astronomers in Tokyo detected something even further. Another suspected proto-galaxy called HD1 in Sextons, it has a light travel distance of 13.5 billion light years. Mm. Um, and that would place it today at 33.4 billion light years distant. Uh, they still need to do some more spectroscopic studies of this object to confirm it as the new record holder for the furthest thing that we've ever been able to detect. We're not going to ever see something much further, though, because we're looking back in time at HD1, if it confirms at that distance, to a point almost before stars started to form in the universe, the so-called cosmic dark ages. So we might find something a tad further, 
but not much further. It'll be like breaking the world high jump record at eight feet, one half inch. Somebody may break it someday, but if they do, it'll be by one centimeter, not by several inches. And that brings us finally to the question of how far we can see given the fact that our universe is expanding and that we're limited by the speed of light. These are cosmological horizons and they're a little more complex. So I'll try to simplify it here. The first is we need to understand four things about the universe. One, it's expanding. Uh, it's expanding at a rate of roughly 48,000 miles per hour for every million light years between two points. So if you have two objects a million light years apart, 48,000 miles per hour. If you have two objects a billion light years apart, 48 million miles per hour. Uh, now that does not mean that objects that are a million light years away, Andromeda, for example, is 2.5 million light years away, are moving away from us. Gravitationally bound systems are not affected by this expansion. It occurs in the space between galaxy groups and clusters. Second thing to understand is that if we get a point far enough away from us, about 14.4 billion light years, the expansion of space will be carrying that point away from us at the speed of light. So if we have a galaxy that's 14.4 billion light years from us, our galaxy and that galaxy are just sitting in space, but the space is expanding and the rate of expansion is carrying them apart at the speed of light. I told you a moment ago that GNZ 11 today lies at 32 billion light years. So it's being separated from us today at more than twice the speed of light. This does not violate special relativity. This expansion of the universe today we know is accelerating. It's expanding ra more rapidly with each passing year. And the third, fourth and final point to note is that this expansion and the speed of light make cosmological large distances harder to understand. And here's why. Take GNZ 11, for example. GNZ 11's light left it when it was a little proto-galaxy, about... Uh, when it was about eight tenths of a billion light years away from us. The universe was very small back then. And the uh, light left there and started on its way to us. By the time the light got to us through this expanding space, however, it had traveled 13.4 billion light years. And during the time that happened, the galaxy had receded to a distance of 32 billion light years. Now to make this more logical, uh, more easy to understand, um, let me give you an example of a father teaching his daughter to swim. I'd like you to imagine the father has now told his daughter, Emily, how to do the crawl and how to kick her feet. Now it's time to swim to dad. And dad's going to stand 10 feet away in the pool. Now, Emily's hanging on to the wall. <clears throat> we'll call the wall GNZ 11. And Emily will be our photon. And dad, that's us. Now, there's one problem. This is a magic swimming pool. The swimming pool constantly expands. The walls get further apart. The floor extends. Extra water is sprinkled in to keep the depth up. And so Emily lets go of the wall and begins to swim the 10 feet. And she swims and swims and swims and finally exhausted, arrives at dad after swimming 100 feet. And more amazingly, when she looks back over her shoulder, she realizes the wall is now 300 feet behind her. So what's happened here is GNZ 11's story. GNZ 11 was just about eight tenths of a billion light years away when the light left there on its way to us. It had to swim 10 feet, but it ended up swimming 100 feet, 13.4 billion light years. And by the time it did, the galaxy had receded to 300 feet away, 32 billion light years. That's the difficulty that we have talking about really large distances in the universe. It's not so much a problem if you're talking about things a billion or two billion light years away, but when you get up around 12 or 13, it becomes very significant. Now, another thing you might notice is that if Emily turns around and tries to swim back to the wall, she can never get there. She can only swim at a certain speed, the speed of light. But there's so much pool expanding now that it overcomes her ability to make up the distance. She loses ground. It's now beyond her horizon. That wall is beyond her horizon, and dad is beyond the wall's horizon. They can't reach each other. So just to simplify these horizons that we have, which are limits on how far we can see, imagine for a moment that 13.8 billion light years is the maximum distance from which light has had time to travel to us in the age of the universe, which is 13.8 billion years. And here's that point, the Hubble distance out at 14.4 billion light years, this is where points 
or being pulled away from us at the speed of light. Okay, so where do we put GNZ11? Well, it actually should be put here, about an eight tenths of a billion light years away. The light travel distance ended up being 13.4 billion light years. And by the time the light arrived on Earth for us to take that picture of GNZ11, it had receded out here to 32 billion light years, the furthest galaxy that we've confirmed ever seeing. There are also other galaxies, of course, that had light travel time that was shorter, and they are closer today. Most of the galaxies we see are way out here though, closer than GNZ 11, but still way out there. The further out you go, the more galaxies we run into the, uh, because of the volume of space in each different shell as we move out. So what if we had a galaxy that was shining to us such that its light had taken the entire age of the universe to reach us, 13.8 billion years. There are no such galaxies, none had formed when the universe became transparent shortly after the Big Bang. But if there had been something shining then whose light took the entire age of the universe to reach us, we would know that object today lay at 46 billion light years. That's the distance that astronomers call the edge of the observable universe. It is the location today of the furthest things that we can see today. Now, again, GNZ 11 or perhaps HD1 uh, holds that record. But if there was a hypothetical galaxy whose light took the entire age to get here, it would be at 46 and no further. Now the question is, what about a galaxy today at 15 billion light years distance? Can we see it? Sure, we can see, H we can see HD1, we can see GNZ11, we can see all of these hundreds of billions of galaxies way out here. So clearly we can see this galaxy because it emitted light when it was much closer to us in the past. But what if something happens on that galaxy today? What if there's a supernova occurring uh, on a galaxy that is at a distance that is moving, being pulled away from us at more than the speed of light. Can the photons from that supernova overcome the expansion that's going on between us and it? It would seem that it couldn't possibly do so. But even though that galaxy and we are being separated at more than the speed of light, the distance between the galaxy and our Hubble distance is not. And so the photons can make it to the Hubble distance. And once they get inside, they will be able to make it the rest of the way. And at some point in the future, we will see that supernova. At 16, the photons can just barely overcome the expansion of space to get inside our Hubble distance, and they too will make it. Any galaxy that today is beyond 16 billion light years, however, a supernova occurs or someone sends us a signal from that galaxy, it will never ever reach us no matter how many trillions of years we wait. And so we have another horizon out there called the cosmic event horizon. Beyond that, everything is unreachable. Anything that is today beyond 16 billion light years, we can't get there. We can't send light or radio signals to it. We can't receive signals or ever see an event that's occurring there today. It simply can't get to us. Everything out there is unreachable. Now notice that that includes hundreds of billions of galaxies that we see in photographs. So when you look at a picture like this and you see all of these galaxies, bear in mind that 96.7% of the galaxies that we see now are unreachable. The last photons that we will ever receive from those galaxies left there a long time ago. They're still streaming in, so you can still go out and photograph them. We can still send up the James Webb or the Hubble Space Telescope and photograph them but that will only last for so many billion years before those last photons reach us. And in fact, over 98% of the galaxies that we will ever see, uh, including the ones we see now, are unreachable. Kind of a daunting fact, I think. And so with that, uh, I will stop share and uh, turn it back over to Terry. Okay, I'm sitting here with my mind boggled. <laughs> That, that is amazing when you really stop and think about everything that you cover. That's why I didn't even try to describe it, because it covers so many different things and areas. But it does. It really kind of boggles the mind when you stop and think about this. It, you know, it's, it, to me, it, in a way, it relates to the distance and trying to get people to comprehend the distance in the universe because it's so huge you really have nothing to compare it to so it makes it hard especially when you're dealing with kids you know how do you how do you say a billion light years and you know 
But I mean, it is amazing when you think about it. So thank you, Chuck. That You're was welcome. truly amazing. I greatly appreciate that. My so, pleasure. Right. Thank you, Terry. You are welcome. I am going to ask the questions. So let's start uh, with this. We are doing winter hats today. Um, that is, let me share my screen. I'm sorry, I took off in the wrong place. We are doing winter hats for door prizes tonight. Um, this is what the store has in stock right now, and they have quite a few of them, so you might even be able to select your color. Remember, if somebody internationally wins, we are having problems with shipping internationally because sometimes things are getting held up. But it will be three winners will receive one hat each. So this isn't like the GSP. Please send your answers in the next 30 minutes because I will announce the winners after Jessica's talk. So please send them as quickly as you can. And someone from the Astronomical League will contact the winners. And remember, your answers will go to secretary at astroleague.org. All right, so here is the first question for tonight. Now, if you listen to Jim's talk closely, the answer was in there. Who is the keynote speaker at, Alcon, at the Alcon 2022 banquet in Albuquerque, New Mexico? Excellent speaker. I'm looking forward to listening and send your answer to secretary at astroleague.org. Okay, what type of nebula is the turtle nebula? Hmm. There's so many to choose from. So again, answers to secretary at astroleague.org. Approximately how many times has the sun flared this week. Mm. The sun in cycle 25 is getting really crazy active. Um, what was it? The first um, solar quake, I think they have pictures of today, or I just saw yesterday or today. It is amazing how active the sun is getting. So yeah, it's been active this week. Again, approximately um, during this week, how many times has the sun flared? I, I was baffled. So send your answers to secretary at astroleague.org. I think the next one should say answers. So that is where I am going to stop. Um, let me stop sharing. Scott, let's take a 10 minute break and okay. we are going to come back with Dr. Jessica Novello. And she has got an amazing talk for us. So 10 minutes and we'll be back with Dr. Novello. Okay, here we Thank go. Thank you. Yep.
all of these images here, there's no audio behind this uh, visualization or actually the images themselves, uh, but these are done uh, from the Event Horizon Telescope team. And of, and of course, course this, this image, image is um, the uh, latest uh, black hole image taken of our own Milky Way's uh, um, Sagittarius A region. So what a great uh, time we live in. And um, what do you think, Terry? I think now, every time I look up at the center of the Milky Way, in my mind, I'm going to see this. You know, I think it just gives you another way of seeing our universe, something that, you know, we know where the center is, the galactic center. It's just incredible to me. It really is. And the stories that are some of the information I have read about it here just today, actually, I don't, it does, it blows your mind. I mean, it, Absolutely. it's, it's kind of like we see our own, our very own black hole that's in our own galaxy. I just, I think it's incredible. So, yeah, it's a great time to be in astronomy. I mean, in COVID, oh. we had so many members join, and so many really cool things are happening. So, yeah, that is that is great. Uh, uh, another thing that I've definitely had fun discussing today. So, with that, uh, next up is our keynote speaker. Her name is Dr. Jessica New. Now, see, I told you. Uh, as soon as I go to say your name, even though I've got it right, I'll mess it up. I do this every time. Nuvelio, uh, she's a planetary scientist and the nexus for the Exoplanet System Science NASA Postdoctoral Management Fellow at Goddard Space Flight Center in Green Bank, Maryland. She is also the science PI of the NASA-funded project to study Cairo, Cairo, Cairo uh, Yes, cryo uh, volcanism on Pluto's moon Charon. She earned her BS in physics and earth and planetary sciences from Johns Hopkins University and her PhD from the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. She has also done research on Europa, asteroids and the Kuiper Belt object Haumea, Venus and exoplanets, you can find her at Twitter at Jessica Nuvelio. So Jessica, thank you so much for being here tonight. Your talk will be amazing. Um, and I'm going to let you go ahead and start with that. And we're looking forward to it. I'm, I'm so thrilled to be here and to be speaking to all of you. Um, I'm not trained as an astronomer but I still study space. So it's a, a weird intersection of, I like to study rocks and I like to touch rocks on earth. How can I do that in space? The answer is be a planetary scientist. So um, I'm going to be talking to you today about a whole bunch of different planetary bodies in the solar system and a few that are outside of the solar system in the form of exoplanets. So um, I'd like to formally introduce myself before we begin and give you a little bit of background on who I am and, and what my own scientific background is. So my name is Dr. Jessica Noviello. I, am, uh, I have a very long official job title, but officially I am the Postdoctoral Management Program Fellow at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. My job is a little bit different from a typical postdoc in that I have half of my time for, excuse me, devoted to research and the other half is actually devoted to uh, NASA management activities. So I get to see how science works from many different perspectives and that part's really fun. Um, so yes, I've, I actually started in planetary sci science by studying asteroids and then I went to Europa, which is around Jupiter. Then I went to the Kuiper Belt and then I went to exoplanets. So in a way, it's, it's kind of funny how I just keep moving farther and farther away from Earth. I think eventually I'll, I'll get up to studying galaxies and then I'll, I'll come back and give a galaxies talk to you all. But um, in the ample amount of spare time that I had as a grad student, uh, wink, wink, I also got very involved in paleontology. That's always been a love of mine as well. So I, I get outside a lot and it's, it's a lot of fun to um, 
to go outside and explore. So this is who I am as a person. And, and I'm somebody who's very focused on exploration and, and trying to figure out what the different rocks, not only on Earth, but in the solar system, tell us about the history of the solar system itself and all of the many different bodies that are within it. But tonight, I'm here to talk to you about cryovolcanism. And you might have the question of what is cryovolcanism? And that is an excellent question to have. So officially, the scientific definition is the eruption of water, ice, and dissolved volatiles onto a planetary body's surface. But in reality, if you ever heard the words ice volcano, that's pretty much what cryovolcanism is. Um, instead of exuding very hot liquid molten rock, uh, a cryovolcano would actually exude all of this. Actually, we're not quite sure exactly what it is, but it's probably some very salty, slushy material. It's probably very cold. Um, it still needs to flow, though, so it can't be quite as cold as ice, um, but something that's just above that freezing temperature for the composition that it is. And we'll talk about why so many of these details are so fuzzy within this talk. Um, so what we do know about cryovolcanism so far, and when I say we, I mean planetary scientists, we think that this is an important process, particularly in the outer solar system, so anything beyond the asteroid belt. But the problem is we don't actually know all that much about it. We see evidence of it happening. There was that excellent video that we saw at the beginning of this meeting, and it talked about Ceres, and it talked about geysers on Enceladus. but. So we know that cryovolcanism exists, but we don't know for sure exactly how it works. We do have a lot of questions about cryovolcanism, and the more that we explore the solar system, the more questions, but also answers we seem to have. And one of the most recent places that we've discovered, as well as the most distant, was the Pluto system in 2015 with the flyby mission of the, of the New Horizons flyby mission. Now, this was a mission that actually launched in 2006, and it took nine years to get out to Pluto. And once it got out there, all it did was fly by. It did not have the fuel to actually get into orbit. So we really just have one swath of pictures. But what we could see from that swath of pictures, even though it was only one side of both Pluto and Charon, its largest moon, uh, we see that the entire surface does seem, especially on Charon, the entire surface does seem to be smooth. And that smoothness has to be from a cryovolcanic flow. There had to be, have been some kind of liquid, because otherwise rocky surfaces just aren't that smooth naturally. And I, I did misspeak earlier. I said the whole surface. It's more like 40% of its entire body. But even that is an estimate, again, because we've only seen one side of it. But because we have this relatively new and recent data from Sharon, and because we have more advanced technology now in terms of the models that we use and the computing power that we have, Sharon actually became one of the ideal places to study cryovolcanism and potentially take cryovolcanism on Sharon and figure it out for many different places in the solar system. So tonight I'm going to take you on a tour of the solar system. We're going to focus on bodies that either were or are cryovolcanically active, and uh, then I will take you outside of the solar system. Again, I am getting a bit ahead of myself because I keep saying cryovolcanism this and cryovolcanism that, but I haven't actually explained what regular volcanism is. We know that volcanism on Earth is one of these most uh, important processes. It's something that can radically change Earth's surface almost on a moment's notice and sometimes without any kind of warning and it makes it a very violent and destructive force. But it's also very important for forming new land, especially in places like Hawaii. But volcanism at its core is a planet's way of removing heat from its interior. So when you as a human uh, exercise outside, you start to get really warm, you can sweat. A planet cannot sweat. It doesn't have any kind of metabolism like that. But what it can do is it can release that heat from its interior into its exterior. Um, and that can de depend on whether it has, a, it has an atmosphere or not. Uh, that heat can get released into space. But basically, um, in a nutshell, volcanism is really just a planet sweating. 
volcanoes are present on most of the solar system bodies above 600 miles in diameter. So this is most of the big ones that you probably know by name. Uh, there are many, many thousands of smaller asteroids, but some of them are just so small that they don't really have any kind of activity on them whatsoever. So uh, volcanism is clearly something that happens when a planet gets big enough. So what is big enough? About 600 miles in diameter. These eruptions are driven by pressure and buoyancy. So liquid rock is less dense than the surrounding rock around it. And when something is less dense, it's going to want to rise up. This uh, gravity differential actually drives part of volcanism. Uh, other parts of it could be pressure from beneath. Maybe there's uh, some kind of upwelling happening in the mantle and it's actively pushing stuff out. That's another driver of volcanism. But mostly it is this pressure or uh, sorry, this buoyancy differential. So the lighter stuff is coming up through the heavier stuff and it's just exiting the planet on its surface, uh, underneath the ocean, in many, many different places on the surface of the Earth, it turns out. So where does volcanism happen? Um, some of you may know of the Ring of Fire in the Pacific Ocean. It's called this because there are many, many volcanoes that are just along this boundary. And the reason there are volcanoes here is because Earth's surface is divided up into tectonic plates. And these plates are made from the crust and the topmost layer of the mantle, the more ductile lithosphere. And it slides along and all of these crate or all of these plates start to crash into each other. Well, some of them crash into each other, some of them diverge, but in almost every case, there's some kind of volcanism going on. So there are uh, in places where the plates are actively crashing into each other, that's where we see increased activity of, uh, of volcanism. But it's not the only place in the world where volcanism can happen. There are many hot spots, uh, such as Hawaii, which are actually in the middle of tectonic plates, and yet we still see volcanic activity there. Another place where hotspot volcanism is fairly common is actually in Flagstaff, Arizona. Now, Flagstaff is a very interesting place, and I just love this, this point. Um, so I try to work it into every talk. But the Flagstaff volcanoes are mostly ashy. So you go up there and, and there are a bunch of cinder cone volcanoes, like pretty much every mountain that you see is, is an extinct volcano. What's very interesting about Flagstaff is all of these volcanoes will erupt exactly one time and then they are dormant forever. So those kinds of volcanoes are called monogenetic which I think is just a fantastic word. And it's a fun fact. If you ever go and visit Flagstaff, you can say, aha, I know that volcano is safe because it only erupts one time, uh, but you got to watch out for other volcanoes that you don't know about yet. Um, so that's, that's a little scary, but it's part of the fun of visiting, I think, um, as opposed to something like Hawaii, which has much more continuous vulcan volcanic activity. So many different flavors and forms of volcanism around the world. Uh, studying one volcano can give you a really good picture of that one volcano and you can go to a different volcano and, and feel like you're starting over from scratch. I mean, studying volcanoes is, is its own field of scientific research for a reason. It is very, very complicated. And humans for many millennia have wanted to know more about volcanoes. And even as they've made their homes near volcanoes and even as some of those homes sometimes got destroyed. I mean, uh, Pompeii is probably the most famous example in history of, of a volcano destroying a village. So uh, there are many, many different folklores about volcanoes, and they're such a fascinating object, and they have been fascinating for many, many years. But what about volcanoes on other planets? I mentioned before that volcanism is actually a very common process throughout the solar system, and here are some examples of that. Uh, the biggest volcano in the solar system is on Mars, and that is Olympus Mons. It's 13 and a half miles tall, or about 13 and a half, and 370 miles wide. It's absolutely enormous. Uh, so to give you a sense of scale, it's two and a half times as tall as Mount Everest. Um, if anybody wants to calculate how far away the horizon is based on that, you know, I'd love to see your answers in the chat, um, perhaps at the end of the talk, and we can talk about that more. But there are other places where you can see uh, volcanoes, especially because different or different 
planetary bodies will show different forms of volcanism itself. So again, it's just such a diverse range. Uh, there are pancake domes on Venus. And they really do look like that. And they really are called pancake domes, um, <laughs> mostly because they really do look like pancakes. The thing that happens on Venus is because Venus's atmosphere is so thick and so heavy, volcanoes can't actually grow to be very tall. So instead of growing tall, they kind of just grow out. Um, so they're still exuding a lot of this lava, but uh, it just goes out instead of up. So that's why volcanoes on Venus tend to look very wide and very flat. But planets are not the only places where we can have volcanism. There's Jupiter's moon Io, which is actually the most volcanically active body in the entire solar system. And we'll talk about why that is in just a few slides. But it's one uh, volcano called Tefashtar is almost constantly erupting. Um, if you ever look at Io, this is a black and white picture, but if you ever look at a picture of Io, it appears very yellow with red rings where the craters are. That yellow is actually sulfur that comes out of the volcano and just deposits itself on the surface of Io. So it, in my mind, it kind of looks like a pizza moon um, or a pizza planet. So if you see, if you ever look at a picture of a, of a moon and you're like, hey, that looks like pizza, you're probably looking at Io. Um, again, I'm just full of fun facts. <laughs> so what, what controls volcanism though? Because I've shown you such a diversity of features on other planets. And of course there is a diversity of features on earth as well. The first set uh, would relate to the magma itself. So how hot is that magma? And uh, how hot is the lava when it comes out? How dense is it? How viscous is it? So viscosity is a measure of how sticky a material is or, or how resistant it is to flow. So something like water is low viscosity and something like honey is high viscosity. So is the magma more like honey or more like water? Uh, how many dissolve or how much and what type of dissolved gases are within this magma? Because yes, um, magma actually can hold gases, especially at uh, deep, deep underground. All of that pressure just uh, pushes the gas into the mixture itself. And so sometimes when it reaches the surface, there's actually this outgassing event where uh, the gas is released almost violently. Um, in, in places like this, you can actually get more of those ash rich volcanoes uh, or volcanic eruptions rather than something that oozes like you might see on Hawaii. But then you can also have things like water content, crystal content, bubble content. All of these change things like the density and the viscosity and the uh, explosive capacity of magma. So there's a lot to, to know when you say like, oh, what kind of magma is that? There's actually a lot that goes into describing exactly what a magma is. But then there's the eruption properties of, of the volcano itself. So how quickly is that magma spewing out? Uh, how much of that magma exists? How many times has it erupted or how many uh, different vents are are spewing magma at the same time from the same volcano. So uh, many, many questions about the volcano itself. So we have like magma properties, there's the volcano properties, and now we can think even bigger when we talk about the planetary properties. So we have gravity. Of course, uh, the Earth is the largest of the terrestrial bodies in the solar system. So it's going to have different gravity from Mars and uh, slightly different gravity from Venus and uh, definitely different from the moon. But all of these places have have volcanism. So the gravity affects exactly uh, how much buoyancy or how much that pressure differential and buoyancy combine to help get the magma out and how much magma comes out also can be a function of gravity. Atmospheric presence and its pressure on the moon, there is no atmosphere on the Mar on on the Mars. On Mars, there is a very thin atmosphere, but then on Venus, there's such a heavy atmosphere that we get the pancake domes instead of something like Olympus Mons. Bulk composition, so that's the bulk composition of the planet. It's basically at its core, what is a planet made of? Um, what kinds of rock, what kinds of minerals, and uh, that feeds into what the magma itself is made of. So all of these are related. But then the biggest one to talk about here, and for us to understand as planetary scientists, or, or one of the most important, is this heat budget. So how much of the heat is being produced by the planet? How much does it need to sweat 
basically, uh, versus how much is it actually sweating? So how much of that heat is actually getting released from the interior? And is it being held by the atmosphere or is it being released into space? So studying the heat budget and knowing what that difference is between how much heat a planet is producing and how much it's releasing is an important metric that we use to study and, and estimate things like volcanic properties on other planets. So what are some main planetary heat sources? Obviously the, the Earth is, uh, it is doing laps around the sun, but it's not really sweating when it does that. So where does the heat come from? The first main one is accretion, which is the process of planetary formation. And what we see in this picture here, uh, taken by the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, is uh, a picture of a very young star, and it has these rings around it. Now, uh, the, the fuzziness that you see is actually a protoplanetary disk of gas and dust. And so the rings that you see are actually places where the dust and the gas isn't. Now, why would there be gaps in a dust and gas ring? We think it's because these rings represent places where baby planets are forming. So as the planets are growing, they're just sweeping up all of that dust and gas. That's what we think is happening here. And it's very cool to look at exoplanets now and see uh, what our solar system might have looked like about four and a half billion years ago. A second source of planetary heat is something called differentiation. So uh, the Earth did not form with the crust, mantle, outer core, inner core. Uh, it had to grow those over time, and it actually grew them pretty quickly, it turns out. So uh, that process of separating out the different layers of a planetary body is called differentiation. And all of this movement of different materials within a planetary body actually creates a lot of friction and it releases a lot of heat. So this is a big source of heat, especially in young planets. In older planets, we have the much more uh, recognizable radioactive decay. Uh, this is something that is still active on the Earth. It's actually the main source of heat for the Earth. And it's when unstable elements inside of a planet's interior, uh, mostly in the core, it actually, as these unstable elements decay, they release heat that heat then needs to get out. Um, it's trying to establish an equilibrium with the rest of the body. So it, it's trying, the heat is trying to move around. It eventually makes it out in the form of volcanism. And then finally, we have something called tidal flexing. Now I'm going to leave this a bit ambiguous because the next slide is 100% on tidal flexing. But I will tell you, it is the most important source of heat in the outer solar system. Now, just to uh, orient your minds, the accretion and differentiation are considered sources of, of or short-lived sources of heat. So they happen really quickly in a planet's lifetime and then they're done. Like the Earth is not going to re-differentiate. Um, if it did, we would have to sustain a monstrous impact. So something like another moon forming impact would have to help us or have to hit us. Humans and pretty much all life on Earth would die out almost instantly from something like that. And at that point, the Earth would uh, redifferentiate. So we're going to cross our fingers and hope that doesn't happen. Um, so, but that's that's done for now. Uh, so what we have now are these more long-lived long -lived sources of heat in radioactive decay. And uh, as we'll see in a moment, tidal flexing. So what is tidal flexing? What we have, uh, I've already mentioned that it is the most important heat source in the outer solar system. And a lot of that is because bodies in the outer solar system are a lot smaller than the Earth and uh, they don't have as much of a reservoir of these radioactive decaying elements as the Earth does. So um, there's also the reality that smaller bodies do tend to cool a lot more quickly than larger bodies. Just larger bodies in general are better at retaining heat. So most of the planets, especially out in, in the outer solar system, are pretty cold already. So the only way that they heat up, or usually the only way that they heat up is through something called tidal flexing. And tidal flexing refers to the distortion of a planetary body that it experiences due to the gravity of, an, of a planet that it orbits. So in the Galilean moon system, which uh, all four of these moons, they orbit Jupiter. And this is the order that they order. Uh, this is the order that they orbit Jupiter in. So Io is the closest. 
uh, most close to uh, Jupiter. Then there's Europa, Ganymede, which is the largest moon in the solar system, and then Callisto. What's interesting about Io, Europa, and Ganymede is that those three are in something called a resonance. So for every four loops that Io does, Europa does two, and Ganymede does one. So it's this very, uh, it's actually a lucky pattern that keeps their orbits slightly not a circle, so slightly elliptical. And that actually helps uh, drive, drive this tidal flexing. So what happens on a moon like Io, again, the most active volcanic planet in the solar system, and Europa, which we'll hear about more soon, what happens on all of these moons is that as it orbits Jupiter, and because it's not on a perfect circle orbit, it's, these moons are slightly closer to Jupiter at some points in their orbit, and they're farther away at others. And it's such a severe difference. Like, it doesn't sound like it's much of a difference, but Jupiter is so big, and these moons are orbiting so close. Europa goes around Jupiter once every three and a half days, so um, it's, it's very, very fast to go around such a large planet. But because it's happening so fast, and it's orbiting a planet as massive as Jupiter, it's shape is actually changing. It's actually flexing as much as plus or minus about 30 meters. So that's about 100 feet. That's an awfully big difference in size. And uh, it's it's just like like when you have a burger and you're trying to smush it down. It's kind of like what's happening, but on a, on a planetary scale. And this flexing causes a lot of friction. And this friction actually leads to a lot of heat. So on places like Io, Europa, and to a lesser extent, Ganymede, that's what's driving, that's the source of heat in the outer solar system. So without that, there would be no volcanic activity on Io. It's only because it's so close to Jupiter and because it orbits so quickly. So that was a very long explanation, but um, it's such an important topic and it's such an important driver for what we'll talk about later that I really wanted to uh, emphasize and explain it. So now that we've talked about volcanism, uh, let's talk about cryovolcanism. Let's go back to these ice volcanoes I kept uh, hinting to. So first up, we're gonna talk about Ceres because it's actually the closest potential cryovolcano in the solar system. So this is, uh, Ceres is a dwarf planet that orbits in the asteroid belt. And from 2015 to 2018, it was orbited by a mission called the Dawn mission. And while the Dawn mission was orbiting Ceres, it found this prominent mountain called a Huna Mons. And it wasn't until a little bit after that it had, it had been discovered and it was really cool, like, wow, there's a mountain on a dwarf planet, you know, who, who knew? Uh, well, we didn't know until we went there and saw it actually. And through different study, we learned that it was a relatively young feature. And then through even more study of uh, particularly what Ahuna Mons was actually made of, people started saying, hey, this might be a cryovolcano because there's no way we get that shape and that size with this kind of composition unless it's some kind of liquid oozing out. And uh, Steve Desch and Mark Nevu are two people that I work with now who actually put forward uh, one of the first papers suggesting that a Huna Mons could be a cryovolcano. So this is a very interesting result because this is, again, the, the closest one to the sun. So we're learning about the limits for cryovolcanism just by discovering where they are and where they might be. But what was really important about Ahuna Mons is that it, it also determined that cryovolcanism is possible if there is a high amount of ammonia present. Now, if any of you live in cold climates, you probably put antifreeze in your car during the winter. And you're doing that so that the uh, liquids that you have in your engines don't freeze, which is a very good thing, or it's a very bad thing if they freeze. So it's a good thing to uh, use antifreeze uh, responsibly. So, uh, but you're doing that because adding ammonia and other salts to a liquid mixture actually will lower the temperature that it would freeze at. So instead of it, of normal water freezing at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you add in some salt and you add in some ammonia and it could drive it down to something like 20 degrees. So your uh, liquids will stay liquid for 
in colder climates. So uh, ammonia ends up being a really important thing in cryovolcanism too, for exactly the same reason it's important in your cars. But there are other places in the solar system where cryovolcanism is. Uh, Jupiter's moon Europa, I think, is the perfect example of an ocean world. It's got a beautiful ice shell all around it, and then there's a thin liquid water ocean. Uh, so Europa is actually about the size of our moon, and I mentioned earlier it orbits Jupiter once every three and a half days. So it's a, a very different system, but just to give you an idea of its size, it's, it's about our moon, just around Jupiter. Uh, so the, the ocean itself probably has a lot of that salt water. Again, we see the presence of salt is a very important thing, but we're not entirely sure what kind of salt it is. It turns out it's a very heated debate um, that <laughs> I am not going to comment on. I'm just going to say it is an active area of planetary science research. Uh, there is evidence, though, that the ocean is interacting with the surface. So again, we're seeing some kind of material coming out from the inside to the outside. So what is driving that is a big question. And once again, I'll mention that tidal flexing is, is the big driver of, of heat on Europa. Now, here are some of the features that we actually see. This is what I studied for years to do my PhD work. So if you have questions about that, feel free to ask. But I want to uh, point out a couple of things here. One is that we're not entirely sure how these features form. Now we can see really big features on Europa. These are very small scale features and there are literally thousands of them over the surface of the moon. And yet we still don't really have an idea of, of how they form. Uh, are they related to each other or are these formed by totally different processes? We're still not 100% sure. But specifically this one here, this hybrid that's kind of in the, the middle of the screen or the, the bottom middle of the screen, kind of looks like there's a little hill surrounded by a moat. And it is actually called a moat in the literature. And it's been theorized that this moat could be cryovolcanic outflow, that we might look at a hybrid feature and actually be looking at a cryovolcano on Europa. But again, Europa is not the only place. Uh, we, we just keep going out and out and we see more and more of these cryovolcanoes. Uh, Titan's moon and, or excuse me, Saturn's moons of Enceladus and Titan are excellent examples of cryovolcanism hosting moons. Um, Enceladus has these beautiful geysers that shoot out material from the South Pole. And uh, Titan itself is the focus, actually, of an upcoming mission called Dragonfly. That mission is super cool. It's going to basically send a drone to Titan, and the drone is going to fly around and look at all kinds of different spots. I don't yet know if it's going to look at this place on the right here called Doom Mons. Um, I don't know if the landing sites have been decided yet. But uh, Doom Mons, and yes, that is its real name, and I believe it's named after uh, Tolkien. It's a Tolkien reference. Uh, and it's thought to be one of the biggest cryovolcanoes in the entire solar system. It's uh, almost a mile tall and it's 37 miles across. So it's, it's very large. And this is about all we know about it is we think it might be a cryovolcano and we know how big it is, but we'd really like to learn a whole lot more about it and tighten in the process. But going even further out to Uranus and Neptune, uh, we only have a couple of pictures of all of these objects. Um, remember how I said the New Horizons mission, all it could do was fly by, uh, was fly by Pluto and Charon. Unfortunately, <laughs> an even earlier mission called Voyager 2, uh, which launched in the 70s, um, it took, uh, it passed Uranus and the Ur Uranian system in 1986, and it didn't even get to Neptune until 1989. So we have not seen these moons again since either 86 or 89. And yet we looked at them and we think, wow, there's so much going on on these places. And then we don't understand it, especially with Triton, which is uh, Neptune's biggest moon. And we think this is one of the prime examples of cryovolcanism, again, because of the, the texture of its terrain and, and how relatively smooth it is. But it's certainly not the only place in the solar system where these moons are. Um, I do want to point out that these images are not to scale, that uh, Triton is quite a bit bigger than um, Ariel and Miranda. So, um, 
I really should have put scale bar bars here now that I'm looking at it, but um, I, I just want to emphasize like there's so much going on in the outer solar system and it's and stuff might be going on right now and we just have no idea. So um, happily, the Planetary Science and Astrobiology Decadal Survey came out three weeks ago and it recommended that within the next decade, we start planning a return mission to Uranus. This is a really big deal because, again, we haven't seen any of the Uranian system since 1986. Now, it won't be for a very long time even after that. Like all we, all we have to do now is start planning the mission. We're not necessarily even launching the mission in the next decade, but hopefully within the next, let's say, 20 years, we will have new pictures of the Uranian system. Um, Neptune's going to have to wait just teeny bit longer, but um, I personally would love to see both. So now let's get to the big questions of cryovolcanism, though. Now, I, I keep saying like, oh, we see it everywhere, but the truth is we don't really know how it works. This is a big outstanding question in planetary science. Uh, first off, there's the buoyancy issue. Liquid water is denser than solid water. So having water rise through an ice shell like liquid rock would rise through a rocky crust doesn't work in quite the same way because that buoyancy uh, is reversed. So, so how does cryovolcanism work? How do we get any kind of eruption? And then the answer has to be something is, something is pressurizing the interior and it's pushing the stuff out. So then there's a question of like, where is that pressure coming from? But what even is a typical cryomagma composition? What is it made of? How sticky is it? How much gas does it have? What is its salt content? What kinds of salts are in it? What about bubbles and crystals? And we don't know. This is a big question mark in planetary science. It's like we clearly see evidence of it happening in many places in the outer solar system, but we don't know much about it. Uh, we don't even know how much cryo lava could be released. We don't know how often it happens. We just know that it happens. So I kind of sat there and I was like, you know what, maybe we should figure out what goes on because, uh, and this is where the whole idea for, for the proposal that the team put in uh, came from, is it's driven by this need to understand cryovolcanism because it is a fundamental process of these rocky and icy planets that we do not understand. So it's everywhere. And yet, again, big question mark. So let's go back to Pluto. I've kind of danced around it for a little while, but why did I pick Sharon? Why is Sharon the right place to be? What we see on this slide is an image of the New Horizons mission. Um, this is an artist's image in space. Um, so it's only about the size of a, grand, of a baby grand piano or a small, like a two-door car. It's not a big mission at all. And it only carried with it a few instruments, I think only four. But what it was able to do was look at Pluto, which is in the middle, and get back all kinds of different pictures, including information about what is on its surface, especially in terms of the ice composition. And that's what you see in that third panel over on the right, is you see four different um, ice types and the intensity of the colors maps out how much of that particular ice type there is. There, uh, the purple is CH4, that's in the top left. Top right is nitrogen ice, that's yellow. Carbon monoxide is green in the bottom left. And then our classic water ice in the bottom right in blue. So it's interesting to see the different distributions of these ices and, and how they overlap and in what quantities they overlap. But then we started looking at the pictures of Pluto's largest moon, Charon. And uh, this, is, this is all that we see of it. So you can tell it, it's not the full moon. Again, we only see about 40% of it. But if you look closely at the very middle of this image, you can kind of see that there's a ridge that goes diagonally through the center of it. And the top ab above that or north of that, the terrain is a bit more blocky and rocky. And then south of that, it appears to be a lot smoother. Like there do seem to be quite a few small craters and it's this relatively smooth terrain. And we looked at that and we said, hmm, okay, that's interesting. And uh, many people came out and said, okay, that smooth terrain is obviously a cryovolcanic flow. That's how it got that smooth in the first place. Um, great, cool, it's cryovolcanism. 
great. But how did it get there? Again, big questions in planetary science. So Sharon is about 750 miles in diameter and it co-orbits Pluto. It's not the only moon of Pluto, it's just the biggest and it's the closest. And uh, the Pluto-Sharon system is also quite interesting in that they, Sharon doesn't orbit Pluto, they kind of orbit each other or they orbit a, a point that's in the middle, in between both of them, but neither, it not in either of, of their, of their bodies. So what we have here in Sharon and on Pluto is that they're both kind of inducing tidal flexing on each other. And that's a very interesting dynamic that, that part of our work is going to investigate, but um, how does one's change influence the others, if at all? Uh, but it's overall, Sharon's overall density suggests that its interior is made of a mixture of ice and rock, and it's likely differentiated. It's big enough to be differentiated. Uh, from the measurements that we have of its surface, we know that it's dominated by water-bearing ice and that ammonia-bearing ice too. So again, we have this presence of salts on the surface. Um, and we talked about how it lowers freezing points before. Uh, that's a big clue that cryovolcanism has happened on Sharon. Oh, look, here's some more evidence for it. Uh, so that that place uh, north of the big uh, ridge, or actually it's more of a canyon. Uh, so the area north of that canyon is called Ozterra. It's more blocky and uh, deep troughs. So it's, it's much more almost like our moon surface. But then the Vulcan Planitia area, which is south of that chasm, is relatively smooth. It's actually lower in elevation than uh, the northern portion. And we can tell from the craters that it's actually slightly younger, but both areas are about 4 billion years old. And we, we get that from counting the craters themselves. Here's some more evidence of some particular uh, smaller scale features on Sharon's surface. We have Clark on the left and Kubrick Montes on the right. These are uh, domes that are, or these uh, raised features, I'm gonna hesitate to call them domes actually, uh, that are about two and a half to three kilometers above the plane. So three kilometers is about a mile and a half. Um, but what's interesting about these is that uh, once again, we're starting to see this dome-like feature or, or this raised feature inside of a moat. Remember how we saw that on Europa and we thought, oh, maybe that is evidence of cryovolcanism on Europa? Well, maybe that's what's happening here too on Sharon. And it looks a little different because the, the rock and ice composition is, is different, but, but maybe there's something similar happening here. Oh, that's very curious though. We also have, um, and shown in the image on the right, this pitted terrain. It almost looks like uh, the skin of a melon or a cantaloupe. And we see this kind of terrain on Triton as well, so Triton, Neptune's moon. And we think it might be caused by gas escaping from the cryolava. So the gas kind of rides up with the cryolava, it's dissolved within it, and then once it reaches the surface, there's no more atmosphere to hold it in and it just escapes. Maybe that's what's happening. Maybe that's what caused the pitted terrain that we see. So these are all just ideas. We don't actually know for sure yet, but let me tell you about how we're going to try and figure it out. So we have these big fundamental questions of Sharon. Relatively smooth material, it's made of ice and ammonia, and we have interpreted that as a massive cryovolcanic flow. We think it might've been caused by a subsurface ocean that actually froze. So as this ocean froze, it expanded because uh, water freezes and water expands when it freezes. So as this ocean freeze froze, it caused tension. Jessica, we've lost some audio here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I apologize. What was the last thing you heard me say? Uh, you were right in the middle of a sentence. Oh dear. Um, was I talking about the frozen ocean? Yes, you were only you were only out for about a sentence or two. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, for telling me. 
So um, that subsurface ocean froze. Whatever was still liquid at the time that most of it was freezing probably got pushed out onto the surface and oozed out. And that's where we think Vulcan planitia might have come from. Unfortunately, we don't have the right ages for these events. Like the timelines don't match up. We think that the surface of Sharon is about 4 billion years old. But from modeling, we know that the ocean itself could not have frozen out prior to about 2 billion years ago. So even with these very large error bars of a billion years, they still don't match up. There's this big discrepancy between what we think we know and what we actually know. But it turns out that this gap, that's just a knowledge gap. And that means that we have to propose something that we have to solve this problem because we need to understand cryovolcanism. So this is what we propose to do. And I just want to highlight my team members here, Steve Desch, who is the PI. There's Kelsey Singer, who works on the New Horizon mission. Mark Navu is an excellent geo, geophysical and geochemical modeler. And Lene Quick is the world expert on cryovolcanism. So um, if you think I know a lot, I mean, you should listen to her talk. Um, but anyway, this is what we propose to do. So first, we're going to actually look at the craters in Vulcan Planitia, and we're going to study how clustered they are. So are some regions just by chance less cratered, or does it represent a place where cryo lava uh, filled up more of it and it just overprinted all of those craters? So is, is, this, an evidence, is this evidence that there is a cryo volcano nearby? Then what we're going to do is we're going to use modeling to study specifically uh, the heat budget and the heat evolution of Sharon itself. And we're going to do this by also considering what's going on in Pluto, because again, they, Pluto and Sharon co-orbit each other. So we're also going to use this to study how and when that ocean first came to be when it might have frozen, and what happened uh, after it froze. We're going to actually investigate the cryovolcanism in this step. So here we're looking at actual observations, we're looking at modeling, and we're trying to merge the two together. And then we're going to take it one step further and say, OK, if we figured it out for Sharon, can we figure it out for other moons in the solar system? Because it's never enough to just figure out one data point. You've got to make sure that it's that you also figure out the other data points as well. That's what makes a really good hypothesis is that it can explain a lot of different uh, a lot of different events happening on different planetary bodies. So here are some examples of what we're going to compare Sharon to. Like once we have this work done, uh, we're going to look at Sharon and we're also going to look at places like Ariel and Miranda and Triton and Titan and Enceladus and Europa and Ceres. And we're going to see um, we're going to see how well our model can do on other planets as well. So I'm just going to check the time here super quick because I don't want to keep anybody too late. Oh, dear. I'm going to have to wrap it up a little quicker. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about what is an ocean world, because I keep talking about water. Uh, liquid water in the solar system is actually fairly common, um, and frozen water is even more common, it turns out, as, as we've talked about in a few places. And it turns out that the connections between ocean worlds, not only in our solar system, but in other solar systems as well, uh, the connection between ocean worlds and cryovolcanically active worlds is very strong. You can't have cryovolcanism if you don't have some kind of liquid water. So follow the water, you might find a cryovolcano. What we have now, uh, we only have so many bodies in our solar system. But if we go to look at other solar systems, we have thousands that we can look for. Add. And most of these we cannot see uh, anything more than their atmospheres, but uh, still our atmospheres can uh, absorb a lot of material that comes out of the interior. So uh, we're, we're now in exoplanet science trying to couple the what's going on in terms of geology on the surface and in the interior to what is expressed in the atmosphere. And we have literally thousands of, of planets to, to examine and to study. And all it does is it helps us put our planets and our solar system into the context of how planets in general work. 
specifically talking about ocean worlds right here. Ooh, there we go. That's where Earth is. So it turns out that there are a lot of places that aren't represented in the planets that we have. We don't have a hot Jupiter in our system. We do have cold gas giants. That would be something like our Jupiter. Uh, we also have things that are bigger than Earth, but, but gassy. Or uh, we have things like super Earths and mini Neptunes, which are bigger terrestrial planets. So they're more massive than Earth, but they're not gas giants like Neptune are. But we also have this category of ocean worlds and ice giants that's right in the middle of this chart here that we don't have a good analogy for in our solar system. So we don't know what these planets look like up close, but we think that there are places out in other solar systems with ocean worlds that are bigger than the Earth, but they might look something like Titan or Europa or Neptune just on a massive, massive, massive scale. We can also talk about these potentially habitable planets because, of course, water is a very important ingredient for life as we know it here. We can make the assumption that it's very important for life elsewhere in the solar system or elsewhere, not only in the solar system, but in other solar systems as well. So studying water helps us answer the question of many questions of astrobiology and the search for life. So if we can study worlds that are cryovolcanically active, even from a very far distance, maybe we can find out which planets are potentially habitable as well. I'm actually gonna skip this, I'm sorry, in the interest of time, because I just wanna emphasize that uh, the work of trying to figure out which planets could even be active is, is a big area of research. A long time ago, we talked about heat budget, which is how much heat is produced versus how much heat is released. And it turns out that, um, so Lene Quick, who again is, is on our cryovolcano team, uh, she, she and her team examined 53 terrestrial exoplanets that were uh, bigger than Earth and smaller than Earth. She considered tidal, so that flexing, and uh, also radiogenic heat, because again, these are as big as Earth. They would have a lot of this radio, radioactive uh, element reservoir. And she found that all of these exoplanets that they studied should be either cryovolcanically or normal volcanically active. And more exciting than that is that about a quarter of them were probably ocean worlds as well, which includes the entire TRAPPIST-1 system that you might have quickly seen on the previous slide. So there's clearly a strong link here um, between planets that have water and planets that are, are cryovolcanically active or might be cryovolcanically active. And it turns out that many planets in general could be, could be active right now. So why does this work matter though? First, volcanic rocks in general are a way to directly sample the planet's interior. And we don't have another way to do it. We can't dig down that far. So whatever comes up, that's our clue of what's going on in the, on the inside. And it's the best, they're the best clues that we're ever gonna get. Volcanoes and cryovolcanoes put gas into the atmosphere, and that might be visible with future telescopes, not just the JWST, but we also can look at things like the um, more in the future, the, the Roman Space Telescope as well. That's going to look at terrestrial word, worlds that are uh, closer to the black hole that was recently photographed in our own, in our own uh, galaxy. We also know that volcanoes, along with plate tectonics, these are, are responsible for recycling material that might be critical to sustain life on a planet. Ocean worlds and cryovolcanism are very closely linked. So studying cryovolcanism actually does aid in the search for life, as well as understanding a fundamental process in the solar system that currently we really don't understand. So I think that's the end of my talk. Here are some highlights from it. Um, I hope we still have some time for questions, but if you don't have a chance to ask a question tonight, feel free to email me. That's my email on the screen. And uh, thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed this talk. And um, yeah, I'm open to questions. Well, thank you, Jessica. Um, I saw that Chuck had put the response about um, in chat. Let's, let's start with that one. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. Um, so Chuck writes, the horizon different, uh, distance excuse me, from the summit of Olympus Mons based on a height of 21.9 kilometers and a Mars radius of 3,389 kilometers would be the square root of H 
times 2r plus h equals 385 kilometers or 239 miles. And that's roughly the view from the top of Mount Everest. And even though Olympus Mons is two and a half times taller, Mars is smaller. So it cuts away, the horizon cuts away to about the same distance. That's very cool. Yeah. That is. <laughs> It's amazing what we've come across during these programs, the information that we do get. It makes you really think. So that is amazing. Does uh, anyone else have any questions? Uh, I, I have one about the, the red pole on Sharon. Uh, I understand that the current theory is that that is Tholins from uh, Pluto atmosphere that was captured or transferred over to Sharon and which uh, was able to crystallize at the pole because it was colder there. Is that still the current view on the Ooh, cause of this? This is such a good question. Because again, this is one of those active areas of planetary science research. Um, my understanding is that Sharon actually formed from a disk of dust and gas that was around Pluto at one point. Um, I think this would have happened after a giant impact event. So part of Sharon is, is Pluto, um, is made from parts of, of debris from Pluto itself. I can also say that there's work that um, there's a student out in Purdue, oh my goodness, Stephanie Menton, who works with Mike Sori, and she has been looking at how ice, um, this is going to sound very, very wild, but I, I promise you it's true. There, there might be seasonality on Sharon, and this would happen very, very slowly because of how far away the entire system is. But over millions and billions of years, there might be migration of ice. And it seems that all of this ice and this stolen material might just end up migrating to the pole and then just kind of camping mm -hmm. out there. So I think, I think that's what's going on. Um, this is, again, it's a really big question, and I think the there's there's a question mark on this too where it's like this is what we think is happening now as we learn more we're going to update our answers but it's it's a lot of different things so yes i think the oh gosh the long an or the short answer to your question is yes it probably came from pluto but part of it might have come from sharon itself and it wasn't necessarily put there um at the beginning it might have actually moved there from elsewhere thank you Hmm. Yes, a guy have a question. Um, if I think of, if I try to think of the whole solar system and the volcan volcanism that goes on throughout the solar system, is there any? I mean, if you if you think of like uh, a star having quakes and ringing, and are do you think that there is any correlation, any connection at all to the solar system itself having? some sort of movement or um, harmonic? Oh, wow, this is also a really good question. There is actually a branch of planetary science called spherical harmonics. Um, it's a little bit different from what you were talking about though, but it is making me wonder if, uh, if, if a sun, if our sun had some kind of quake. Yeah and it sent out some kind of pulse, almost like a gravitational wave, but not quite. I just don't have a better word for what it might be. Could that have instigated some kind of volcanic activity? And the answer is, I guess, I don't know. And I have never heard of anybody like making this connection before. So I, I don't know. Um, I think it would be a lot more powerful in the inner solar system system so where our terrestrial well, I, I planets are. I would believe are. that too. I would yeah. believe that too. But uh, you know the the they the you know when you think of the butterfly effect, you know, uh, maybe it has to do with uh, also moving comets inward uh, to the sun. Maybe it has you know so I don't know. But uh, I just kind of I, I tend to uh, think more about the um, more holistic connected um, part of our, our, our universe. And, uh, the sun's got to be a huge driver in our solar system for any of these tiny effects, I would think. Tiny effects over billions of years, they do add up though. So I, 
I wish I had a better answer for you, Scott. I, I just, I truly do not know, but I'm going to be thinking about that now for like the rest of my career. I'm going to be wondering like, what did the sun do? Right. Anyways. Uh, are there great, any questions? Great talk though, Jessica. Thank you very much. Yeah. Would it be safe to would, early, it, so. would it be safe to say that you wouldn't mind having a few deep ice cores from Sharon? <gasps> <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, I wish. <laughs> uh, from anywhere, really, I would be happy with Europa, which is significantly closer, and you would think it would be easier. But um, no, um, gosh, we okay. We have samples in the form of meteorites from Mars and Venus and maybe from Mercury as well. But as far as I know, we don't have any kind of sample from any of the, the icy moons. But uh, I'll bring up the decadal survey again because it, it tossed out a whole bunch of missions and it said, OK, community, this is what we want you to focus on for the next 10 years. And one of those was a comet sample return. So that would be um, go go to a comet, land there, and, and bring stuff back. And we've done that with asteroids to um, the Japanese mission Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2, and then the NASA mission OSIRIS-REx. Um, we also had the Rosetta mission that was uh, done by the European Space Agency, and that was um, like 2014 that it landed on Comet 67P. So um, that wasn't a sample return, though. So we're thinking we, we want now to focus on a sample return mission and actually bring back a piece of ice from a comet or, you know, whatever a comet is made of, you know, mostly rock and ice. Um, another mission, though, that was prioritized was a series sample return mission. So again, series, the, the place where Hunamans is, it's the closest potential uh, cryovolcano to the sun and to us. So why not go there and just get a piece of it and bring it back and see what it looks like up close. So um, hopefully we have a couple of these missions go out. There's no guarantee that just because the decadal survey put it forward that those missions will happen. But let's cross our fingers and hope that cryovolcan uh, cryovolcanism gets a, a very good representation over the next 10 years. Yeah, definitely. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? Or Scott, do you have any anywhere? Uh, just uh, there was some comments. Jessica was very fun to listen to because of her passion. Um, uh, Pekka says uh, they are also dedicated to their work. Um, oh, thank you all. Jeff Y says, I think I could watch this three times and, and learn a lot each time. Uh, I think you're going to have a lot of people um watching this program again and again so yeah there's a lot of information here it, it really makes you stop and think i'm again i feel like cryovolcanism is this it, it's a very understudied process and i think it's just because up until recently we haven't had a lot of data that we could use to study it in detail there you go. here's a question all right uh josh Mucatelli says i have a question in, in volcanism uh there is an event known as the Phreatic eruption, where water flashes to steam. Could an analog of this be the cause of the pitting? Ooh. Oh, okay. This is a really good question. So I'm not by training a volcanologist. So you're getting a very, you're getting answers that based off of one class that I took in grad school. Friato uh, magmatic eruption, yes, it does result in a, in a lot of steam that suddenly gets released because it finally reaches the surface. So it's it's part of explosive volcanism. And usually that happens around a vent. So the pitted terrain that we saw on Sharon, it's not near anything that appears to be a vent. That doesn't mean it is not near a vent. The vent could have existed and then actually filled in itself once the uh, cryo once the eruption ended so maybe it's just invisible now or maybe we're just not looking in the right place part of my work is going to be looking at all of these places in very fine detail to see if there's anything that we missed to look for any evidence of a potential vent so it could be the result of of a free magmatic eruption 
um, but I would say only by the vent surface. The extent of the pitting terrain that we see probably suggests it's more of an outgassing event, but there's no reason to think that it has to be one or the other. It could just be both in different places. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, is there any word on the uh, proposed Enceladus sampling mission? Explore one of, mission? yeah, uh, that's actually one of the, so there are three different classes of mission types at NASA, and uh, there's the discovery class, which is the smallest class. There's New Frontiers, which is what New Horizons was actually part of, and then there's flagship. So the next flagship mission is going to be Europa Clipper. That's going to launch in, oh, very soon, actually, uh, 2024, I believe, and then it should get to the Europa in 2030. So only eight more years to wait, everybody. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the next flagship mission after that is probably going to be that Uranus mission, but one of the middle class, one of the potential options for that middle class of mission is a, uh, not an Enceladus sample return, but a specifically dedicated mission to go to Enceladus with very high tech equipment to, uh, to analyze its plumes as in as much detail as possible. So again, not a guarantee that that mission will happen, but it is a priority over the next decade. Thank you. And another question, what would be the most interesting object uh, to scientists beyond Pluto? <gasps> beyond Pluto. Oh, okay. I was going to say Triton, but that's not beyond Pluto. So, <laughs> oh, darn. Well, I, I snuck the answer in anyway. Um, <laughs> I, I'm torn between like what I think is the coolest versus what I think is actually possible to do. Mm -hmm. um, because I would love to go to the TRAPPIST-1 system and see what it looks like to see a solar mm -hmm. system around a totally different star type, uh, especially because at least three of those planets are thought to be in the habitable zone. So what do those planets look like up close? What is their geology like? And what kind of geophysics is going on there? Um, realistically, because I don't think we, at least not in my lifetime, certainly, but I don't think we're going to go to the TRAPPIST-1 system anytime soon. So a mission that I would like to see within the solar system, but beyond Pluto, would be a mission to the Kuiper Belt object Haumea, which um, I have studied, so I'm a bit biased towards it, mm -hmm. but let me tell you how cool it is. It's uh, a, an object that's kind of shaped like a, a fat pancake. So <laughs> it's about a thousand kilometers long, it's about 800 kilometers wide, and then it's only about uh, 700 kilometers um, in the along its axis. So it's it's like really long and and not so tall. So it's kind of like a very very maybe it's like a stack of pancakes kind of shape. But it's it also has a rotational period of about four hours. So it's the largest, fastest spinning body in the entire solar system. And there's a big question of like, how did it get to be that? Uh, how, how did that happen? And if that wasn't cool enough, there's also two moons that it has. It has a ring system. It also has a red spot on it that might be uh, organic material. So exactly what kind of material that red spot is. Very interesting question. Could Haumea also have been an ocean world and a cryovolcanically active body? We don't know because we can only look at it through telescopes. So we've never actually sent a mission out that way. So I would say the coolest object beyond Pluto, still within our solar system, would be that Kuiper Belt object, Haumea. And then uh, there, there was a question, although you might have already answered this. Um, uh, uh, are there any uh, moons that have moon quakes or movements on tectonic plates? Mm. So we have not observed tectonic plates anywhere else other than the Earth. We think that Venus had them at some point, and we also think that Mars might have had them at some point, but now both of those planets are, um, they have one plate, and it's just the shell of the planet. Europa is actually the closest place that I could think of that might have what is the closest to tectonic activity. And I have to really couch my language there because it's not exactly the same as what we have here on Earth. 
what we see on Europa is a lot of ridges and we see a lot of, of bands. So there's clearly areas of on Europa where there's some kind of extension happening and there's also some kind of compression happening like is very common on tectonic plate boundaries under on earth in 2014 a paper came out uh, led by louise proctor that actually coined the term subsumption which is not quite subduction but uh, clearly something that might be happening where a piece of the ice is actually uh, starting to go underneath another piece of ice now again we don't know for sure because we only have like one mission's worth of Europa data. We're hoping that when we go back with the Europa Clipper mission and when it reaches there in uh, the Europa system in 2030, that uh, we might see some changes on the surface and we might be able to, to estimate how long those changes took to happen, whether they happened rapidly or, or slowly over time. And we might see evidence there on Europa of, of the closest thing to tectonic plates that we see anywhere, except Earth, of course. OK. Is that it? I think so. <laughs> All I think right. So people were uh, generally blown away that, uh, <laughs> and yeah. really, really impressed with your passion and uh, your knowledge. And um, uh, you gave them a lot to, uh, to think about. So I think that's great. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for, for having me and thank you all for, for being here and asking such incredible questions. This was really fun. <laughs> well, thank you, Jessica. We're so glad to have you and your talk was, it just boggles the mind. It makes you stop and really, really think about a lot of different things that uh, I never really thought that much about. So thank you. Uh, we definitely appreciate it and I hope you have a great weekend and wish you luck on all of your work that you are pursuing. Thank you. Um, when we publish our papers, I'll be sure to let you know. Yeah, do that. Do that. We'd love to know. So, all right. Well, thank you. Uh, I am going to give the answers to the questions uh, that we asked as soon as I um, we'll pick up right where we left off for the questions for tonight. We're not going to do that. We're going to do the answers for tonight. Let's go here. Okay, answers for tonight. Seth Showstack is the speaker, which uh, Jim had mentioned, and Michael Overracker answered that correct question correctly. What type of nebula is the Turtle Nebula? It is a planetary nebula in Hercules, and Josh Kovach answered that question right. And approximately, how many times has the sun flared during this week? It is approximately 30 times this week alone, which is just amazing. And Andrew Corkhill answered that correctly. So congratulations to all the winners. You're all going to win a winter cap and somebody from the Astronomical League office will be contacting you. So I would like to thank everybody, Jim Fordyce, all the information for Alcon. He's the president of the Albuquerque Astronomical Society. Scott Roberts, we couldn't have done this without you. Thank, thank you. you very much. And David Levy, as always, he's always part of it and always starts us off. Chuck Allen, hey, your talk was amazing too. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. And Jessica Novellio, planetary scientist at Goddard. Thank you. Uh, amazing talk. So many. This was really a great night for a lot of amazing talks. So thank you all. I appreciate you being here so much. We've enjoyed everything that you have done. And please join us for the next Astronomical League Live. We'll be back on Friday. June 17th at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and we'll come back with more information about that a little bit later on. So unless anybody else has anything, um, we say thank you to all, I say thank you to everybody on this show and for everybody that's watching us. We really appreciate it, and we hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. So thank you very much, and unless somebody has something else to add, We'll go Somebody's ahead. wanting to know, is this the last broadcast I'm going to do tonight? And the answer is yes. 
He said, I have to get some sleep. He's in Sweden, so he's like way up late. So anyways, you have an international audience watching this. Thank you so much, everyone in the audience uh, for your great questions and um, and for sticking there with us through a couple of programs. And um, uh, hopefully you got a lot out of that. I, I, I'm sure you did. So I know you did. Yep. Terry, thank okay. you so much. Uh, terrific program. And um, thank you, Scott. We couldn't have done it without you. So thank you very much. And thank you, everybody. We appreciate everything you do. We'll right. catch you next month. All right. All right. Bye. Take care. Good night, everyone. Good night. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.